For the first time in eight years, Massachusetts poised to elect a new leader. Jeff Deal determined to keep the corner office in GOP hands. I declare Maura Healy to be the people's worst nightmare. Maura Healy fighting for the flip. The issues are too important. The times are too urgent. Both ready to go head to head. But this battle has a twist. Voter reaction in real time. Live from WCVB Channel 5 Boston. With our partners, the Boston Globe, WBUR, and Univision. This is a Commitment 2022 special. The final debate. And now tonight's moderator, New Center 5's Ed Hardy. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's debate, the final one in the critical race to decide the future of the Commonwealth. One of the candidates here tonight with us in Studio B will be the next governor of Massachusetts. They are Republican and former state lawmaker Jeff Deal and Democrat and current Attorney General Maury Healy. We thank you both for being with us tonight for the final debate. Spanish language closed caption service and Spanish audio translation of the debate are also available. Instructions are at the bottom of your screen. El servicio de subtítulos en español y la traducción de audio al español de este debate están disponibles. En las instrucciones se encuentran en la parte inferior de la pantalla. And it's also being broadcast in Spanish on Univision, Boston's WUNI, and Univision, Springfield's WHTX. También se transmite en español por WUNI de Univision Boston y WHTX the University on Springfield. We have four panelists with us tonight asking most of the questions. Tiziana Deering, host of Radio Boston on WBUR. Boston Globe columnist Adrian Walker, my co-host from On the Record here at Channel 5, WCBB's Janet Wu, and Univision news anchor Linda Guerrero. It's great to have all of you with us tonight. New Center 5's political reporter Sharman Sacchetti is standing by right now live at UMass Boston to explain how this will work, not only here in our studios in Needham, but live reaction, Sharman. Ed, we have an engaged crowd here at UMass Boston. Essentially, what we're going to be doing is checking in with them. They're going to be watching it live, real time. Uh, this is a focus group. We're just getting settled. We're waiting to see uh, what both candidates have to say, and we are going to be asking them a lot of questions afterwards, and we'll follow up. Back to you. Sounds great, Sharman. Thank you. We will check in with Sharman roughly halfway through the debate tonight, and she will have a full report tonight on News Center 5 at 11 of what we've gleaned from this evening's conversation. But right now, it's it's time to get things started. The candidates will have, as you know, you're familiar with the rotation. We'll have a minute for responses tonight, 30 seconds for rebuttals. We do encourage conversation between the two of you throughout the evening. Random draws have determined not only the podium position that you see here tonight, but the order of the closing statements as well. So let's get off to the questions initially. And let me start with you, Miss Healy. Will you accept the results of the November 8th election? Absolutely. Unhesitatingly, absolutely. Absolutely. And look, this is the difference in this race because my opponent is an election denier. He supports election deniers out there, including most recently last week when he went on a right wing radio station the morning after our debate and once again talked about the big lie, uh, talked about the election being rigged, talked about Joe Biden not being the legitimate president. And I just point that out because those are really dangerous statements in this time. Those are the kinds of statements that incited the violence, the attack on the United States Capitol that resulted in injury and death to police officers. And so I absolutely have faith in our democracy. I will, as governor, work to protect our democracy and certainly protect safe elections. Mr. Deal, same question to you. Will, will you accept the results of the November 8th election? Absolutely. And I've already said I... Unhesitatingly. Absolutely. And I already said I accepted the results of the 2020 election. Of course, Joe Biden is our president. My 401k and a lot of people's are becoming 201ks right now because of it. The fact of the matter is, it's okay to question elections. Elizabeth, excuse me, uh, Hillary Clinton still, I don't think, has accepted the 2016 election. Even uh, our senator, um, uh, it, uh, at Senator Markey, excuse me, uh, says that we have a stolen Supreme Court because of a stolen election. So, look, it's okay to say that things like mail-in balloting in certain states may have been handled badly. I ultimately understand that Joe Biden was certified and became our president. The fact of the matter is, Maura Healey is the one talking about dangerous statements when she said in 2020, during the riots happening around the country, that uh, 
when bur businesses were burning, uh, people were looting, there was arson, and people were being murdered protecting their stores. She said, yes, America's burning, but that's how forests grow. That's the dangerous rhetoric that she talks about that is dividing our country and can divide Massachusetts as well. Janet Wu, continue the questioning. Let's talk about the economy, which is, I think, uppermost in the minds of most of the voters and people that don't even necessarily vote. Right now, everyone from those watching this debate to those who pay very little t attention to politics on a day-to-day -day basis, they are all consumed with fear over rising costs due to inflation and also the loss of their jobs if there's a full-blown recession. If elected, Ms. Healy, where will you focus your attention first to alleviate their budget worries? Cutting taxes, cutting taxes. I hope this month we see, Janet, those tax rebate checks go out to taxpayers. We also need to pass the tax reforms that Governor Baker proposed. These were tax cuts for seniors, renters, low-income, middle-income families. They included things like changes to the estate tax and, importantly, earned income credit for families. In addition, I have proposed to give each family a tax credit of $600 per child. So I'll start there. I've also talked about the need to drive up housing supply because the cost of housing across this street is out of control for so, for so many people. And we need to make sure that we are driving down housing costs. Those are some of the things that I am going to get to work on day one. We'll get a chance to sort of drill down on both of those issues. Mr. Deal, the question goes to you. Yeah, you know, so it's interesting. Uh, my opponent is talking about how she wants to cut taxes, and yet she's for question one, which will actually raise taxes and drive out capital out of Massachusetts, making it harder for those who invest in businesses to help us grow the jobs that we need for people. By the way, today I'm very thankful that the striking Cisco uh, Teamsters were able to resolve their issue uh, with their contract. They now have a good contract. They were out there striking for three weeks. They were very nervous about what was going to be happening with this economy for them if they couldn't afford the uh, housing, the food, the fuel, the home heating, that it's going to go up 64% electric rates thanks to Maura Healy's blocking two pipelines coming into Massachusetts. We now have an economy that she and the person she supported for President Joe Biden have been making very unaffordable for all people around the country, but specifically here in Massachusetts. What's the first thing you will do to alleviate the a budget? Of course, I'm going to cut taxes, and we're going to make sure that we make sure that there's a, a looking at spending on Beacon Hill. I've served for eight years on Beacon Hill, four years on the Ways and Means Committee. I know exactly where the state spends its money and does a great job. I know the areas where we have room for improvement. A response, Ms. Ealing? You know, I've traveled all over the state, Ed, and worked hard to protect workers, including workers like those folks who were, were striking recently. You know, uh, we have got to do everything we can for families. They're hurting. I understand that. I understand right now it's really hard to pay for health care, for gas, for groceries, for heating, for housing, for so much. And I promise you as governor, I am going to work my tail off to make sure that we are doing all we can. That includes tax cuts, tax reform. It includes making sure that money is getting out the door so that we are producing the housing, so that we are fixing transportation and making that more affordable and reliable. We also need to work on child care. This is a huge workforce issue. We need to bring more people back into child care so more child care centers can be open and we can work on driving down the cost of, of child care for people across the state. So much we need to do. I'm prepared to do it. Mr. Deal, a, a, a final statement perhaps on the subject? Yeah, I mean, look, first of all, you need to have balance up on Beacon Hill. You need to have a Republican governor to balance the very left-leaning legislature that right now has $8 billion in excess tax revenue and refuses to give back the $3 billion that she talked about, uh, even when they, everybody knows they're due that money. So we're overtaxing people, first of all. But again, when you have... Uh, hospital mergers that have been approved by your office that have created less competition, of course health care is going to go up. That's a huge problem for Massachusetts. We need more competition in the health care marketplace. Unfortunately, you've taken action that actually makes that more expensive. Yeah, go ahead, Ms. Ms. Thiele, yes. Well, just some things were inaccurate there. First of all, you mentioned the, the pipelines. What I did was actually save Massachusetts residents billions of dollars as a result of that work. Because at the end of the day, the pipeline companies wanted to come in. They wanted us as ratepayers to pay for those pipelines. I said, no, if you're going to build a pipeline, have your investors pay. They chose not to. And if it weren't for that, we would have seen even higher prices, OK? Second, I've spent the last eight years bringing back billions and billions of dollars to the state. I know how to save money. I know how to look after people. I know how to protect people. And I know how to move us forward in what are challenging times. I understand that. Mr. Deal, you, you reacted to that. She's acting like the 
uh, renewable energy sector doesn't require tax uh, incentives and uh, incentives for helping build out the wind and solar in Massachusetts, which Massachusetts ratepayers have been absolutely paying for. And so the fact that you're saying that pipelines are costing us money, but uh, the wind and solar, that's not true. In fact, the pipelines would actually be able to bring us the fuel to our manufacturers and to heat our homes and produce electricity much cheaper than currently having to buy tankers at spot rates and we're not even able to potentially power our homes this uh, coming winter, I've been told by experts that we have potential rolling blackouts that could hit Massachusetts because of the lack of fuel that you've blocked coming into Massachusetts. We could be like California right now. Please. First of all, I didn't block that fuel. Uh, secondly, I think we heard a distinction here. I am all for creating as many energy sources as we can in this state. That may mean wind and solar and hydro. We should be taking advantage of everything because we're in this mess we're in, in part because we don't have the energy independence that we need. And so, unlike my opponent, I don't want to give more power and control to big oil and fossil fuels. I want us to be strong here and energy independent. And that's what my climate agenda is all about. It's an important distinction in this race. Also, for the record, I've demonstrated that time and time again, I stand up to powerful interests. I've already called out the legislature. I'm not afraid to stand up to powerful interests. My interest as governor will be protecting the people of Massachusetts. The questioning, can, you would like to go, Mr. Uh, Deal. Just, final again, final again, response. Standing up to powerful interest, I was opposed by $3 million when I stopped the gas tax from being indexed to go up with inflation automatically in 2014. That would have cost us so much right now. It's on top of the fuel cost, the, the added cost of the tax in Massachusetts would have been like California again. We can't afford that. And I am for renewable energies, of course, but you have to get from A to B in a responsible manner. To try to say we'll be fossil fuel free by 2030, the grid can't handle it. We don't have enough electricity being produced by uh, wind and solar to be able to replace the fossil fuels. We have to make a gradual transfer. I'm an Eagle Scout. I want a clean environment as well. But you've got to be rational in how you do it and not to put a plan in place that will bankrupt every household and drive out every manufacturing uh, person uh, business in the state. T.C. Anna Deering so picks gonna, up the questioning. I'm going to take us back to the taxes portion of this conversation on the economy. You've both been very clear that you'd like to cut taxes, uh, make sure that citizens get back the money from the 1986 tax cap law. The state is flush now. My very straightforward question to you is, should things swing in a very different direction? Are there any circumstances under which you would support raising taxes or overturning tax cuts. This time, Mr. Deal, we'll start with you. Sure. You know, so I came into the legislature in 2010 when in 2008 and 9, the mortgage meltdown caused a large problem with the state collecting enough revenue to be able to pay uh, towns what they needed to for local aid, uh, Chapter 70 school funds. That was one of the big reasons that I ran. So I understand what happens when the state uh, ends up spending more than they should. And in this case, you know, I understand that the state has that surplus. I think what they need to do is manage to hold on to the surplus, you know, beyond the three billion that's supposed to be returned and uh, make sure they've got that in the rainy day fund for what could potentially be a major economic meltdown right now. We're seeing a recession. We're seeing home values drop. We're seeing, uh, again, major manufacturers leaving our state, Raytheon. No, my point is this. We need to make sure that we've got the money for the future, but I don't think the state is ever going to be in a position where we need to raise taxes over the time that I'll be in office as governor. So, no, I don't anticipate ever raising taxes. Thank you. Ms. Healy. Well, Tiziana, I'm not going to commit to particular pledges. I will commit to doing this. Recognizing right now we've got a serious issue with inflation. So many families are, and businesses are struggling with affordability. I'm very focused as well on Massachusetts competitiveness and I don't want to see employers or businesses going elsewhere. So I already talked to you a little bit about the things that I would do as an immediate priority. That includes tax reform, getting that surplus out the door. It also includes dealing with a high cost of housing. We have to wait so to see. We have to wait to see in the though. future. Short and then I'll make pledge. that evaluation. Short of a pledge, can you imagine circumstances where it might be necessary to raise taxes or reverse tax cuts? Again, right now, I can't. I think that the, the point right now is, is to make sure that surplus gets out the door, which long ago I called on the legislature to do without further delay, and I hope those checks are going out uh, soon. I expect them to be sent out soon. I've also called for the acceptance of the proposed tax reforms by Governor Baker. I think they make a lot of sense and are uh, progressive and, and directed at, again, seniors, low-income, middle-income folks, really, really important things. So all of this, you know, the, the fiscal stewardship of this state 
the economic health and well-being of this state is absolutely the priority and a responsibility of a governor, and that is one I take most seriously. I'm proud that over the last... That, that's time, oh, Ms. Steele? Thank you. Mr. Deal, this yeah. time, Ms. Healy. If I could just respond to that, she's already said she's going to raise taxes because she wants question one to pass. We, the state has enough money, they don't need to take any more of your money. And again, that revenue can't be earmarked, like they're saying, for education or transportation. The fact of the matter is, it should be returned. The ballot uh, as, measure does earmark it for transportation and education. No, no, I'm sorry. It goes to the general fund. It cannot be earmarked. Coming from a ballot question, the constitutional amendment will not put that money directly towards Edu uh, education and transportation. That's the, that's the facts. Uh, so again, she's already saying we need to put more taxes on people who actually create the jobs. The folks who invest that money in their homes that create the, the values of the homes to keep our, our market stable, the uh, people who again employ people in the state, that capital will leave or the people will leave. We had 50,000 people leave Massachusetts last year. Uh, affordability in Massachusetts is incredibly, uh, incredibly top of mind right now and raising taxes on people and driving them out that's going to make it more expensive down the road so that's that, that that's that time you would, under Deal. no circumstances would you ever raise taxes regardless of what happens no we've already again the state has already put in place local taxes local meals taxes we've got so many taxes in place right now we have to be looking at places where we're more efficient with the tax dollars that we have miss healy I think the question to Siano is whether I would raise taxes um, question one is a is a matter for the voters. The voters are soon gonna vote on question one and we'll see what they choose to do. But I've been clear about how I'm going to lead as governor. That is with a focus on inflation, affordability. It is with getting the tax relief in place that we need, that's sensible, that's smart. And it's finding ways, again, to deal with some of the drivers of the high cost right now uh, that so many families are experiencing. And that is around housing and transportation, which I am committed to fixing. But that's, that's it, there's a decision distinction between something that is a voter ballot initiative and what you were asking, which is what the next governor would do. And I don't support the, the gas tax. I mean, it, it, th those were gimmicks that only worked for the oil companies. In the other states that have done it, it's only the, the big oil companies that it, Mr. it made out because they price gouged. Mr. Deal. You were one of the drivers of inflation. You chose and supported President Biden. Uh, he's the one who created a war on energy. We were energy independent. You have created your own war on energy in Massachusetts. That is the major driver that's costing businesses more money, passing it on to consumers and making it so expensive to run a business, to employ people, and to try to be competitive with other businesses nearby and globally. Uh, so please, don't tell me that you didn't block those pipelines. You absolutely t blocked Kinder, Kinder Morgan and Access uh, Northeast, and you were happy to say it. Uh, it's, it's on record during a debate with your opponent in the uh, Democratic primary. Ms. Healy. I did, and I stood up for ratepayers, Jeff. I blocked them from having us foot the bill to the tune of billions of dollars. That's what happened there. But look, I think most people out there listening tonight understand something about monetary policy, understand the role of, of the Federal Reserve, the decisions that Jerome Powell is making. You can lay all the blame on Biden. I appreciate that Biden has put forward the Infrastructure Act. He's actually taking steps to address inflation. I want to work and, and continue to support efforts to address inflation. Again, that's, that's my top priority here as governor is making life more affordable right now for families who are hurting across this state. Simple as that. Adrian Walker has the next question. Speaking of affordability, I'd like to go back to housing for a moment. Massachusetts has among the highest housing costs, both home prices and rents in the nation, which is squeezing out our middle class and driving young people out of the state. What can the next governor do to bring housing costs under control? Let's start with you, Ms. Healy. Well, several weeks ago now, maybe months ago, I put out a plan, Adrian, on housing because it's such a top priority for me. Right now, I know so many can't afford rent, they can't afford down payments, they can't afford to even downsize in some instances. And this is an issue not just for Greater Boston, it is happening statewide. Here's what I will do. Appoint a Secretary of Housing who's going to be accountable and driving more supply, driving more production. Number two, we need to continue to invest in housing programs. The HDIP program that provides a lot of support, the transit-oriented building that is happening uh, around the state, we need to continue to support. We need to also deal with uh, 40B. We need to enforce 40B, and we need to take on some of the exclusionary zoning practices that have kept certain developments from going forward. But we need housing, 
affordable across a range of income levels right now in the state. It is imperative for our economic health and well-being. It is imperative for our competitiveness. And importantly, I want Massachusetts to be a place where if you're here, you can stay here. That's the goal. Mr. Deal. Yep. <clears throat> so first of all, again, if you're uh, a police officer that used to be able to live in Southie and you know, one of those uh, triple decker floors, you know, that was where you could go for an affordable house. Now it's a million dollars for a floor of a triple decker in Southie. That's unaffordable. That makes the, the Boston market, shows that the Boston market area is truly uh, getting out of reach for the average folks that are just trying to work there, live there. One of the things that we need to do is alleviate this, the pressure by increasing transportation options outside of uh, Boston. So I think the East-West Rail is one solution that we can do. I think the South Coast Rail uh, is also another way to unlock certain pockets of uh, housing development across the state that are affordable. Also look at other cities as hubs for uh, not only uh, jobs, maybe trying to move businesses to central and western Massachusetts, because again, that can create some more options of affordability in those areas. But we need to also uh, make sure that again, those people who can afford those homes can heat them. And when you have the rising cost of electricity and heating our homes, thanks to Maura Healy, that's a problem. Ms. Healy. You know, I think um, I, I agree with something my opponent said about the need to work on regional solutions. I've talked about that for a long time because it's important that we have transportation fixed, obviously. It's imperative to our economy. Um, it's also really important, though, that we recognize that in some places in, in this state, we need to also provide funds for the rehabilitation, the renovation of existing properties. So it's both new construction and also money for, for preservation, for rehabilitation and renovation. And, uh, you know, my team, um, one of the things I did as attorney general was go into communities, especially gateway cities, and give money to those communities to fix up properties that were dilapidated and blighted and then get them back on the market oftentimes for first-time homeowners. I'm proud of my record on housing, and I will be strong on that as governor. Mr. Deal, any response? Just one thing to, I, when I was talking to the mayors a few months, or a few weeks ago, I should say, uh, Massachusetts mayors, the mayor of Pittsfield uh, mentioned to me something about uh, also needing to have investments in some of the municipal buildings, like police stations and fire departments. And so there's really no funding formula other than the towns having to raise and appropriate that money. And one of the things that I thought might be an interesting option is the Cannabis Commission does generate a pretty decent amount of revenue right now, maybe creating a dedicated stream uh, from that commission to at least uh, assist with, much like how the Mass School building, building Authority gets their money from the lottery, is one way to creatively help those cities and towns fund those municipal buildings that help alleviate the cost of the property taxes in each of those towns. Linda Guerrero has our next question. Now, there are many in the state I understand the value of higher education, yet they can only dream about it. What is your plan to reduce the cost of higher education for low and middle income families? How do we make higher education more accessible to them? Mr. Deal, we'll start with you. Well, first of all, higher education needs to be more of a free market principle. Right now, when the government is the guaranteed payer, and there's a plan right now, uh, again, the president that you supported wants to pay for free college for, for kids. I think that's the wrong way to go, first of all. Uh, many people go into the workforce directly out of high school that don't. Uh, go to college, four-year college, they work in the trades. Why should they be paying for somebody's college education? But if we create more competition in the education marketplace and ask those colleges also to provide the information to those students about where they're going to be placed. Mass Maritime Academy in Massachusetts does a fantastic job, almost 100% placement. And so there's a tremendous value there. There has to be an ROI, a return on investment for the students going to that college. Um, but at the same time, when some of these colleges basically continue to grow and build new buildings and pay these professors, you know, tenured, uh, high tenured salaries, uh, that makes it very hard for kids to afford to go there. Again, I think these schools have to justify what they're spending uh, and make sure that they're producing the, ki the kids and they're aligning their workforce. Time, the kids time to the Mr. Deal. So Massachusetts is home to the first public school in the country, home also to the first public library. We are proud of our education here and proud of the fact that we're a state that values our education. It's even in our constitution. And I am a strong proponent of public education. My opponent wants to return to the days of Betsy DeVos, who my office had to sue time and time again for ripping off students. But this idea that you're gonna let the free market and privatization govern education in the state is just not something that Massachusetts has ever been about. Here's what we need to do. Support higher ed, support our vocational training programs, support our community colleges, implement something that I put forward 
under a Healy Driscoll administration, we're going to have a program called Mass Reconnect, similar to something that the governor of Michigan did to a lot of success, a program for basically ensuring that those 25 years or older can come back into school, into community college, get a degree, get a certificate that is going to make them ready to work today. These are the kinds of investments we need to make. We don't know, need to go in the direction of the private market. I can tell you having taken on predatory student lenders, that doesn't work. M We're gonna stand up for our students Mr. Deal, go education. ahead. As someone who went to a private college, I Surprised you're not a fan of private colleges. However, Massachusetts actually has a history of starting with private institutions before Horace Mann ever created the public school system. So again, when you say that private schools aren't the solution, I disagree. In fact, my plan for school choice is going to allow parents who feel like right now, especially when kids are having their reading levels and their math levels drop, uh, it's time for some choice to make sure that parents feel like their kids are getting the value that they should be getting for the education of their kids. Letting them use the tax dollars to go to private schools or letting them that's, be homeschooled, that's part of my plan. That's time, Mr. Deal. Ms. Healy, your word? Uh, yes, I went to a private college. You went to a private college. The question wasn't about private colleges. I support private colleges and public colleges. Here's what matters, though, and here's what you need to know as governor. The vast majority of students who graduate from our state colleges, community colleges, and universities are going to stay in Massachusetts. I was just out at UMass Amherst the other day. They are training the next generation of engineers for something really important, transportation. We desperately need to fill, I think, close to 2,000 jobs in transportation, engineering and the like in this state. That's a great example of why we need to support our public higher ed. And that's what I'm going to do as governor. That's You're not, I will. Actually not true. You know, one of the things I want to do also is focus on vocational training. A lot of the people coming out of sc uh, high school would like to go right into a, a technical career. And we have a lot of technical careers heading our way, of course, with energy and obviously with, uh, you know, high tech, uh, the biotechnology industry. Some kids can work directly uh, while they're getting that vocational training. So I'd like to increase the vocational capacity. We currently are, are under... We, we don't have enough slots for kids to get that vocational training. I think that's something that we want to uh, talk about beyond just uh, the four-year degrees that uh, may or may not be able to stay here. And by the way, when so, those 50,000 people leaving Massachusetts, a lot of them are kids that, that after time, Mr. Deal. say, I can't afford to stay here. Time, Mr. Deal. Adrian Marco continues the conversation. As winter approaches, I hate to mention it, there are serious concerns about skyrocketing energy prices and even rolling blackouts coming to Massachusetts as events far beyond our state continue to shake the global markets. What specifically will you do to ensure affordable energy for Massachusetts residents? We'll start with you, Ms. Healy. Well, first of all, I recognize the significant issue this presents for so many residents for our businesses, Adrian. And so I've already gotten to work on this. Uh, my team has already said that we strongly support Governor Baker's efforts with the other New England governors because this is a regional issue to call on the Biden administration for relief. Congress recently acted. There's $40 million that's now coming to the state that importantly will be used to reduce the cost of those energy bills. Second, we are thinking about ways that we can actually reduce payments uh, and, and spread those costs out over time. But fundamentally, this shows, Adrian, you mentioned the global markets. We're all too subject to the wilds of the global markets. And that's why we need to be strong here in Massachusetts. And I do support all the energy alternatives that are out there, including wind, including solar. Also, that's a key economic engine for our state. We can create a climate corridor that stretches the whole state with manufacturing technology innovation already underway here that's gonna create tens of thousands of green paying jobs. But I am working with utilities, I am working with our congressional delegation, I am working with the Baker administration, and as governor, I will work with other governors to bring relief to that's, folks this winter. Time. So. Her solution is a federal bailout to the immediate crisis that she and Joe Biden created by creating a war on fossil fuels and liquid natural gas that comes into Massachusetts that's put us in an energy crunch this winter. Right now, we are facing this. Not even eight years from now when she wants to be completely fossil fuel free and we will not have the renewable energy to produce enough electricity to make sure that we can handle every manufacturer, every home, every vehicle in Massachusetts. That's going to be the requirement. We're tied to California and being completely uh, electric vehicle by 2035. 
it's an impossibility if we can't generate that electricity, if the grid can't handle it. So she's going to basically ask Washington to use some of the money that they've printed that's creating the inflation and uh, devaluing the dollar in order to bail out New England or Massachusetts because we've decided to take this reckless course of blocking two natural gas pipelines, the cleanest burning fossil fuel that actually will help us right now. Ms. Healy, response. I mean, some of it's just ridiculous. Um, that, but, you know, here, here's where we need to go, Adrian. Yes, I think it's pretty wise and incumbent upon any governor to ask a federal administration to ask Congress for relief when their residents or their businesses are hurting. Governor Baker did that. $40 million is coming that way, this, this way. That said, that's only one of any number of things. I've also called on our current legislature here in the state to use, we talked about surplus funding, to provide relief. You know, imagine a hundred, people are gonna see increases on their bills that are gonna really hurt. And so it matters to me that I can get relief. A hundred dollars off a bill makes a big difference to people in this state. Right. So I'm gonna continue to be an advocate, to continue to push. Uh, but again, we've gotta, we've gotta grow our economy not by giving giving everything over to fossil fuels, we're never going to have time, we're never going to have fossil fuel future if you don't support renewables. We've got to do both at the same time. Mr. Deal, totally support renewables. Look, as we talked about earlier, the state has eight billion now in excess tax revenue. Why do we have to take a single federal dollar to take care of this problem right now? It's a Democrat supermajority in the House and Senate. Why can't you call on them to get this done? And without having to go to the feds to take care of this issue right now, people are hurting right now. So Jen, what is the, the right program for renewables? <laughs> what is the right timeline to get entirely to renewables? Yeah, I mean, look, first of all, again, I'm a believer in the free market system of if it's the right, the right product will appear at the right place based on demand. And of course, I think demand is there for renewables, for wind and solar, absolutely. But you've got to deal with the, uh, the production of it. Right now, we're getting a lot of the solar panels from China. That's not exactly, with the supply chain issues, it's not exactly happening in the speed that we need it to happen. Uh, again, there are also permitting issues with the turbines. But my is point there is this. a target date my that you have in mind? I don't have a target date. I have a, I have a date of saying, let's continue to use every energy source in the mix until we can get a reasonable estimate of when it's going to happen, not creating an artificial deadline of when we have to be off of fossil fuels. That's time, Mr. Deal. Ms. Healy, please. The reason that Governor Baker reached out to Congress and the Biden administration, and the reason I would as governor is because that was a federal program, Jeff. The LIHEAP program is a federal program. The money has to come from the federal government. But beyond that, you know, there's work we need to do. And I have spent as attorney general a lot of time on energy issues, working on issues around modernization of the grid, transmission lines that we need to build. There's so much that we need to do and work on. But this idea that we should just give up and not pursue things because it's hard uh, is absolutely not where we need to be in Massachusetts. That's we can be aggressive, we can go out and do this, and I will work in the meantime to provide the relief. But the idea that I created the high cost of energy, uh, there's a war on in Russia and Ukraine. That's not Massachusetts' fault. That's time. Yeah, the, the, just on energy, one go last ahead. thing, if, if we can uh, go through this, is Maura Healy's in favor of bringing back the TCI, Transportation Climate Initiative, which would create a regional unelected board of people that would decide what kind of fuel could be sold in Massachusetts and how much. That, again, is going to restrict and increase the cost of fuel in our state at a time when we are in an energy crisis by doing that, you're going to create more of a problem when it comes to heating our homes or pumping gas in our cars just to get to and from work. That is uh, irresponsible. And also, it shouldn't be an unelected board. It should be uh, people Time, in Massachusetts Mr. deciding their future on energy, not a regional group. Ms. Healy, please. That's wrong. I, I never said I supported TCI. I have said, though, that programs like TCI or like REGI, which is the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, are important to consider because we're not going to solve this by being Massachusetts alone. We've got to work with the entire Northeast on this issue. That's what it means to be a governor. It means that you're going to have the ability to reach out, work in a bipartisan way with other governors to do what you need to do. And I think that when it comes to energy and what we're dealing with, that is absolutely the direction we need to go. We absolutely need Janet, to think about this from a regional perspective Janet, as well. who has the next question? Mr. Deal, um, you applauded the Supreme Court's uh, ruling to overturn Roe versus Wade. Right now, health care professionals and abortion advocates are organizing to provide both access to the procedures as well as abortion pills to those from out of state. If elected, 
Will you stop either of those things from happening? No, Janet, and I, let me just clarify, you know, when Roe v. Wade came down with the Dobbs decision, I agreed with it, just like Ruth Bader Ginsburg felt that it shouldn't have been that federal court decision. It should be a state's issue, and it is a state's issue. And Massachusetts handled it by passing the Roe Act. Even though Charlie Baker had two objections in the Roe Act, they overrode him on those issues. It's the law of the land. My job is to, to protect women's health care choices, and I will do that. But also protecting women is beyond just abortion. There are other issues. There's issues like my running mate, Leah Allen, a nurse who was fired from her job because she didn't want to get a vaccine because she was nursing a baby she had just had while she had been working on a COVID ward and did not think that the vaccine might, she was worried about the effect on her child. We should be protecting those women's choices as well. My wife runs a business. It was shut down during, during the pandemic. Did anybody protect those business owners like my wife? Those are women's choices. My two daughters were forced to go home from school and didn't get back into the classrooms for a year and a half because of decisions that were made not protecting their rights of, for an education. So there's women's rights beyond abortion that are important to protect. Mr. Deal. But, let's talk, but, but let's talk specifically about the abortion pills and the procedures for people from out of state. If the doctors and the abortion advocates need support from the state, are you willing to provide it or will you try to stop it? Look, I think Massachusetts should be helping Massachusetts citizens, but at the same will time... Will you try to stop abortion pills from being sent time, outside of the state? At the same time, I understand that the legislature has a different feeling, and no, I, I think it's going to it's going to stay and we'll protect that. Ms. Healy? I just don't believe that. I mean, um, <laughs> this is a real distinction in this race. And as somebody who has fought hard, both in the courtrooms and, and outside, to support a woman's right to an abortion, to make that choice for herself, you know, this is a race where my opponent celebrated when Roe was overturned. He celebrated it. He thinks it's a good decision and a good idea. He wants to defund Planned Parenthood. He said he wants to jail doctors who provide abortion care. And it stretches beyond that because there was a time he didn't believe in contraception for any unmarried woman. This is not who we are, Massachusetts. I will be a governor who will protect reproductive freedom, who will support and protect our doctors, our providers, and who will always, always protect the right of a woman to make that intensely personal, an often difficult decision for herself. The section that the Roe Act uh, that was objected by Governor Baker was section 112, 12P, which basically removes the protection of an infant born from a failed abortion to be given medical care by a doctor. To me, that's infanticide. That is what I consider to be something that's beyond the, beyond the pale of abortion rights. Okay. The other thing, too, is I don't think you seem to understand the difference between governor and legislature. The governor enacts the laws or, or executes the laws that the legislature passes. As governor, I don't make the decision on the Roe Act. The legislature is a Democrat-controlled House and Senate. My estimation is that will be the case for a number of years. There is no way I'm changing that law. So to try to scare people, I know it's Halloween. Stop scaring people about abortion. It doesn't make any sense. Ms. Healy. I think many of us remember Justice Kavanaugh when he raised his right hand and swore an oath to never overturn Roe. I think that people should measure us by our record, by our actions, and my opponent's record and his actions on this could not be more clear. As I said, he does not support a woman's access to abortion. And, 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 the, and the use of the term infanticide is just a rip uh, from the Trump playbook and an extreme playbook um, that does not honor or respect a woman who is faced with an incredibly difficult decision. And I just find that really wrong. And again, as I'm committed as governor to do everything I can to stand up and protect the rights of women, to protect providers, because Massachusetts stands for and supports ensuring a woman's access to abortion. My view on abortion, I just have to clarify, comes from personal experience. My parents made the decision to have me when Roe v. Wade was not the law. Had it been the law, I was told I may not have been here. Look, and that is my own personal experience I'm sharing with you. The fact is that just shapes my view on abortion. However, I also know in legislating that there are times when you have to put your personal decisions aside and understand that the legislature and the people of Massachusetts have spoken on this issue. Abortion will be protected when I'm governor, despite what she wants you to think. 
it's just not it's just not true. The governor absolutely has a lot to do in this space. You think about a governor's administration, what they're going to do with mass health, what they're going to do with health care, what they're going to do across a range of agencies that directly intersect on this issue. It's just not the case that it doesn't matter who the governor is. If we didn't have Governor Baker doing what he did immediately following the Dobbs decision, in contrast to my opponent who was celebrating, Governor Baker worked hard with the legislature, my office worked with them as well, to make sure we had protections put in place. That's the kind of leadership we need. We don't need to be going backwards, especially on an issue that yes. is so, so important. Uh, protecting women's access to health care, protecting their reproductive choices, I don't think could be uh, more clear in, in terms of where we are in this race. That's time, Ms. Healy, and it's, it's a wonderful conversation about a very important subject. I'm going to change the pace. I'm going to change the answers a little bit and pick them up. These are short questions, you know, lightning round, and it's just random questions and random answers, but make them as quick as possible, please. I'll start with you, Mr. Deal, first. How will you vote on question one, the millionaire's tax? I think it's clear from earlier, I'm a no on one. We need to make sure that the Beacon Hill, they've got plenty of money, they don't need more of it. Miss Healy. I support it. I think this is, this is money that is necessary to support, sustain important revenue for infrastructure, transportation, and education. We turn to question four, overturning the driver's licenses for people without legal documentation. Miss Healy. Keep the law. 17 other states have it for good reason. It's important for public safety. Mr. Deal. I'm in favor of the repeal. It's a band-aid to the real problem, which is immigration law. We need to get, make people citizens in our country and in our state sooner than what's happening right now. When was the last time that you were on public transit in Massachusetts and campaign events don't count, Mr. Deal? <laughs> Does the, the walkway at the airport count as public <laughs> I don't know. It's a people mover, but I don't know if it's a people that. mover, right? I heard Charlie Baker's voice yeah, over, over, yeah. overhead. That's probably the last time. The, and Miss, Miss Healy, what about you? Just a little while back, my nieces came into the city for the day and we got on a bus. And you got on a bus. Adrian Walker has the next question. The MBTA is a mess, I think we would all agree. Despite years of increased investment, a month-long shutdown of the Orange Line, and an action plan from the federal government, for riders like me, the system feels slower and less reliable than at any time in recent memory. What do you consider the root cause of the MBTA's long-standing dysfunction? And come January, how would you address it? We'll begin with you, Ms. Healy. First of all, um, we don't have a functioning economy unless we have a functioning public transit system. That means our not just bridges and roads, but our rail, our commuter rail, T, buses, our regional transit authorities. These uh, systems need to be safe, affordable, and reliable. And clearly right now, that's not working across the board. Here's what I've proposed. I'm going to appoint a safety chief who is going to look at and inspect all of that and make recommendations about what we need to do. Second of all, I'm going to make sure that we are supporting capital planning, but also operations. That includes workforce right now. There are a lot of open jobs, particularly within DOT. We need to make sure that they're filled, that people are ready and available and able to do that work. We need to make those investments, and that's why my transportation plan is robust, it's comprehensive, but we've got to stop the bleeding and, and make these fixes now, now, because it goes to how it goes to quality of life, of course. It goes to Massachusetts competitiveness, and it's fundamental to moving us forward. Yeah, I don't think uh, the Attorney General and I disagree on uh, the importance of the MBTA at all. I think it just might be a, a difference in how we get there. Um, one of the things I do think is a problem in statewide beyond the MBTA is employees, lack of employees. Uh, the vaccine mandates that force people out of their jobs, they either took early retirement or they were fired, has affected not only state troopers, but it's also affected people at DCF, people at the MBTA. On day one, I rehire all of the people who lost their job because of the vaccine mandate, those state workers get their jobs back, including at the MBTA. That's why the federal government had to come in and provide oversight because of safety issues due to lack of staffing. But on top of that, I think we need to look at a longer term solution. There was the fiscal control board that Charlie Baker put in place after the blizzard of 2015 that caused major problems. I think if we take that fiscal control board and add a safety component to the uh, to what their responsibilities are, that might be a solution or potentially looking at maybe Massport. They are a cash cow 
when it comes to revenue. They handle transportation. They work with federal partners on transportation. Why not have them potentially look at the MBTA as a, an added component that's, to what they do? That's time, Mr. Deal. Thank you very much. As, as we mentioned at the top of the debate, we have a group of voters that are watching this conversation in real time. They have seen just a little more than half of it by now. So let's head out to New Center 5's political party, Charmin Cicada. She's at UMass Boston's McCormick Graduate School to see how it's going in that room. Charmin. That's right, Ed. We're going to be taking a pulse of the people, so to speak. Taxes, abortion, the housing crisis, cost of education. We're going to come over here and talk with a couple of voters who've been listening and paying attention. We're going to start with you, Shafin Hassan. Uh, what part of this resonated most with you? Well, um, from all the issues that were discussed, I would definitely believe I definitely believe that um, uh, or each one of the candidates take on education matters the most for me. I'm a student. I go to university and uh, I believe that each one of their plans really stuck with me. That, that yeah. definitely resonated. Yes. What didn't you like what you were hearing? Um, well, <laughs> um, maybe, okay, with regards to education, um, I didn't really agree with um, Representative Deal's position. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do believe that at the end, that if either one of the candidates do become our next governor, that they will fight for the middle class and they will fight for the people of Massachusetts. All right, Shafin, thank you. Yeah. And we want to make it clear that the candidates cannot hear what the voters are saying, but our viewers certainly are. We're going to come over here to Robert Sherman. We want to thank you. So what, what resonated with you? I thought that Ms. Healy, I like the idea that she talked about working with other governors on problems, their transportation posts. Um, Mr. Deal, I thought was too negative talking about bad things that happened during COVID. We should be moving on, not reflecting elections in a couple of weeks. Tell us something that you're going to do in the future, not talk about negative things from the past. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Awesome. Sherman. And uh, we're going to go ahead and send it back to you, Ed. All right, Sherman. I interesting feedback, interesting conversation. Let's continue the debate. Linda Guerrero has the next question. Thank you. We've seen an influx of undocumented immigrants in the last few months. Do you encourage them to come? And what specifically should the state do to meet their basic needs like food, work, housing, when they arrive. Mr. Deal, one minute. Thank you, Linda. The, uh, like I said, when I was in the legislature, I wanted to try to speed up immigrant uh, processing. You know, we have a Department of Immigration and Refugees that says their joint funding from the federal and state uh, agencies only provides them the ability to process about 1,500 people a year. That's way less than the, the current uh, people that are eligible to become citizens. So I want to make sure that, again, we help them become citizens sooner. Yes, providing them, the refugees, the, the people that are coming to our state, we need to make sure that they are protected, uh, given the support they need to become citizens. Because, again, I mentioned earlier, we lost 50,000 people. We have the room, obviously, that's not the issue. And I think we're a much, much better commonwealth from the diversity that those people from different countries bring. So I want to make sure that immigration reform is done. I'd like to get our federal partners to stop blocking immigration reform, whether it's Republicans or Democrats. I mean, Democrats have had the House and Senate with the president right now. I'm not sure spending trillion dollar bills was more important than trying to fix immigration. That's the core issue that seems to be affecting Massachusetts and our country right now. Why couldn't they have done, to prioritize that? That'd be what I'd urge my federal partners once I'm governor. Ms. Healy, your turn. Well, um, I could not agree more that Congress needs to act and they need to pass bipartisan legislation that fixes our immigration system, period. That needs to happen because every day we suffer and pay a price for it all around this country. I think about the migrants in Martha's Vineyard a few weeks ago. I, I'm really proud of the way that Massachusetts and the people of Martha's Vineyard responded, the steps taken by the Baker administration to make sure that, that folks were, were given food and housing um, and that they were able to, to continue with their legal process of seeking asylum, which is what they had done actually when they when they crossed the border in that instance. So, you know, I'm proud of Massachusetts, but it is a shame that we have seen complete inaction by Congress on this important issue. It's also the case that we desperately need to fix our, our immigration issues so that we have workforce here in the state, so that we have the visas and so that we have people coming in because I've talked to, to business owners, I'm sure you have as well, all across the state, major employers as well, desperately in need of workers and too stymied by a broken immigration system. 
Tiziana, let's let's continue the conversation with a different question in the time that we have left. Go ahead. So, Mr. Deal, you've said that if elected, you would do away with any vaccine mandate. So let's talk about COVID for a minute here. If there is a COVID surge during this winter season, would you reinstate masks in schools and government buildings? No, I always felt, uh, and again, I think we're starting to see the science prove out. And I should back up. I'm not anti-vaccine. I'm not anti-mask. I just want people to be able to make their own personal choices on that. And I think we've seen from the science now that no matter how many times you were vaccinated or boosted, that did not prevent catching COVID. We heard from Fauci that uh, evidently the masking really wasn't necessarily a great solution. If people feel comfortable with masking or getting vaccinated, that's absolutely their choice. But to me, you're stepping on their civil rights. First of all, we had a lot of workers on the front line, nurses, police, fire, uh, who either developed natural immunity because they caught COVID and didn't want to get vaccinated after that, or they had underlying health issues that a vaccine would have exacerbated and caused them problems. So I think that, uh, again, we can take reasonable precautions to have people stay uh, at home if that's the necessary, necessary solution, but also mask or vaccine at your personal health care choice. And would you be opposed to an individual school imposing a mask mandate? I think, again, the schools should allow the, the students to make up, the parents and the students to make up their minds on that decision. Thank you, Ms. Healy. Well, I think that it's important for us to continue to follow the science, to follow the, the data. That's what the Baker administration has done. I think the Baker administration did that quite well and our state was safer as, as a result. But this is an evolving space of information, of knowledge. So I think we need to continue to follow the, the science and make the best decisions possible based on that. I also you know, respect uh, so much the resilience of people through COVID. When it came to those small businesses who've been absolutely devastated, hurt through this time, I know that my office set up funds to get money out the door to small businesses. We also work to set up programs, support programs that would help landlords uh, as well as tenants. Uh, and, and specifically, we set up a program that was gonna help house first responders and many in the healthcare space uh, during COVID when people needed to, to isolate. So it's just to say, so much harm uh, and a lot of grief and a lot of hurt. We're still working our way through that. So let me but I think we need to make sure that we are following information and science. So as you understand the science now, do you understand masks to be effective? I think that it's, again, a case of evolving science and information on this. I think that masks may be effective in some instances and less effective in others. I certainly am grateful uh, for my opportunity to, to have worn a mask during COVID, as well as my opportunity to, be, to, to have been vaccinated. And I think we know that vaccines uh, have been proven to be safe and effective. And I think the state has done a good job of getting out vaccines to people. So, you know, as that's, with anything, we're time. just gonna have to take it in course. That's time you see. Linda, with so, the next question. Do you mind if I just follow up on the mask issue? Make it real fast, Very please. fast, yeah. I mean, my wife and I ran a learning pod for kids who uh, parents were going back to work in 2021 and they were home three days a week. So they came to the learning pod. They had the masks on while they were remotely in front of a computer. To me, that policy made no sense. Kids were unable to see the face of the person on the other side of the computer, right? I mean, that's taking mask policies too far. I want parents to have more of a say in their kids' masking if it ever were to be asked again. Are you, would you like to say something or can we move on? Just that I think that it is important to note about, about kids, uh, kids being in school, keeping our businesses, keeping our companies open. Uh, that's very important. And of course, I mean, masks, uh, got in the way of a lot, but I also believe that masks save lives, and maybe that's just a, a difference of opinion between us. Your, could you ever see yourself uh, imposing a mask mandate if there was a huge surge for schools or for government buildings? I think it's, it's something we have to take in turn as things happen and evaluate and be ready to take whatever steps are necessary. Uh, I know I'm not a, a big proponent of, of of uh, making judgments about things without without the science, without the data, without the information. That's just that's just who I am. Linda, go ahead. Much of the emissions in the state come from cars, trucks, homes, offices, and power plants that provide electricity for lights, computers, and appliances. Looking ahead at the upcoming lawsuits against the fossil fuel industry, what is the plan to further reduce greenhouse gas emissions? Mr. Deal, one minute. 
So again, our state is already part of a compact with Reggie Emissions so that uh, businesses are, or manufacturing is responsible for trying to reduce the carbon footprint. And again, I think the free market will ultimately help us develop the, uh, the right mix of uh, electric cars. I, I drove a hybrid car myself, which was fantastic. Um, it helped obviously reduce uh, you know, the cost of mileage, but it was also something that helped create a cleaner environment. Uh, the other thing too, I think, is that um, we've got to make sure that we uh, do not allow the reduction of fossil fuels to happen in a pace in which we just can't afford it. I think I said that earlier, but it bears repeating. So while I want to be able to move towards renewable energies, you just can't take it out of the mix until we're ready for it. Uh, and I think, again, liquid natural gas has been proven to be one of the cleanest options out there. I think we should also be looking at uh, nuclear power as a potential replacement down the road. I know we just closed Pilgrim Nuclear Power, but there are newer versions of nuclear power. That's that time, cleaner. Mr. Deal. And, Thank you. Uh, yeah. Ms. Healy? There's a lot that we need to do. Um, and, you know, it's a shame that we were lied to by the fossil fuel companies for so long. I sued ExxonMobil for lying about climate change. Their lies, their deception probably set us back 50, 60, 70 years. Here's what we need to do and what I will do as governor. I'm going to make sure that we are supporting a diverse energy portfolio. So that means... That means, that means gas, it means which, which we have and we're going to have for, for some time. The key with that is what does the grid look like? What does transmission look like? How efficient are we being? But beyond that, it's wind, it's solar, it's battery storage, which is an important part of us reducing these things. And the way we're going to get there with me as governor, I'm going to have somebody who's a climate chief who's going to make sure that we are driving that across our transportation agencies, our housing agencies, and community development and the like. That's how we'll get there. We, we have reached the end of the pro you, you have an opportunity in a closing statement because it's time now for closing statements. You'll each have a minute. Jeff Deal won the random draw on that and calling on his inner patriots, he's elected to defer. He'll go last. So Maury Healy, you go first. Oh. Well, good evening and thank you all for, for tuning in. I'm here to ask for your vote on November 8th. I've been honored to be your attorney general. I'd be honored to be your governor. I'm going to get to work right away on making life more affordable, cutting taxes, improving education and job training, and always protecting reproductive freedom. I come to this an unlikely politician. I never imagined running for office when I was growing up in a small town in New Hampshire, raised by a single mom, a school nurse, I'm the oldest of five, and yes, I was a basketball player once, uh, and a point guard. And to me, the key about being a point guard is that it's all about the assists. It's never about the points scored. We are gonna go to great places in this state, working together, collaboration, bipartisan, as I have, inside and outside of government. That's what's going to move Massachusetts forward. That's what's going to make us stronger. I believe in Massachusetts. I believe in our people. I ask for your vote on November 8th. Mr. Deal. <clears throat> As a, a father of two, my wife and I live on the South Shore. We own a small business. We put our life savings into it. We've been building that up over the years. We're very proud of that. Uh, we love our community. I ser served on my town finance committee because I wanted to give back in some way. And I ran for the state legislature at 40 years old in 2010 and got in just because I wanted to make sure the state was providing the services we all expect transparently and with an eye towards making sure our tax dollars were protected. I've had a chance to work up in Beacon Hill and learn about exactly how the state can do things better. But at the same time, my opponent thinks that government is the solution to everything. My goal is to provide you more freedom, economic freedom. You should keep more of your money. The state is taking more of it than they need. You should get health care freedom. You should have the choice with your lives to get the health care that you decide, not government forcing it on you. And educational freedom. I'll give parents the choice to educate their kids the way they want to. Jeff Deal, Maura Healy, thank you so much for joining us tonight. This has been the final debate before the election. We thank all of our panelists and our partners in the debate consortium, UMass Boston's McCormick Graduate School for hosting our focus group tonight as always. And remember, early voting gets underway this weekend. Election day is November 8th. We'll see you tonight on New Center 5 at 11. Have a great night.